When I was 13, the dawning of a new millennium took place on New Year's Eve. While people were fearing the worst with the Y2K bug or out partying and drinking, I was home alone. Now in 1996, my parents had split up and from there they divorced and my mother and I moved across the country from Oregon to Tennessee with her best friend. On the eve of the year 2000, I was home alone and my mother was currently out of state. Now this didn't worry me as this was not the first time. I often came home to find a note on the kitchen counter saying they had gone to Florida for a few days and that there were groceries in the fridge. Since the divorce, she would regularly leave me home alone for long periods of time to go to Florida. We lived in a relatively quiet road, surrounded by trees and set a few miles out of town, and I knew most of the people if not by name, then by face enough to wave and small chat with, and had never before been given a reason to be afraid of being alone. On the night in question, I was staying up late watching television. I remember I was watching the movie His Bodyguard on USA Channel, and had most of the lights on in the house, not because I was afraid, but because at 13 I wasn't concerned with electricity bills or saving the environment. I felt completely safe and protected within my little bubble of a home. As I was watching the movie, I kept hearing these weird sounds outside, but I remember thinking it was probably the neighbors. Though they weren't extremely close, a couple of them were having a party or people over for the holiday. About halfway into the movie, however, the power in the house suddenly went dead. I sat on the couch for a minute, just sort of in a panic daze, because it was near midnight and pitch black. I remember thinking the power must have gone out and that it would come back on, so I just decided to sit on the couch with my blanket and wait. A few minutes passed by when I heard a noise in the kitchen where the back door is. My heart started racing in my chest because I thought it sounded like the back door being shut. The back door sits just off the dining room which is connected to the kitchen which leads directly into the living room where I was currently sitting on the couch. A few seconds passed after I had heard the sound and I was straining my ears to pick up anything that wasn't supposed to be there. Every noise suddenly felt magnified. When footsteps sounded on the floor I immediately slithered off the couch onto all fours crawled around the ottoman and started as slowly and as quietly as I could to make my way toward the space between the love seat and the couch. I knew if I could fit under the side table and be completely hidden by the dark in the ottoman from playing hide and go seek in the dark many many times with my friends during sleepovers. I was nearly there when the footsteps became more apparent. I knew from the sound of them that whoever it was was making their way through the kitchen now toward the living room. They weren't hurried or anything. It was like they were just moving around in the kitchen. I glanced up from where I was crouched on the floor and to my horror, there was a dark silhouette standing in the archway between the two rooms. To my credit, I didn't scream. However, I did panic. I stood immediately to my feet from my hiding spot and ran down the hallway and I believe the only reason I wasn't overcome was because the person chasing me had to get around the ottoman in the dark to follow me. I did what all children do when they're afraid, and I bypassed the front door, the guest bedroom, the bathroom, and ran to the farthest door down the hallway, my room. In all honesty, I probably wouldn't have been able to get the front door unlocked and opened in time, as it was right off the side of the couch. When I was ten, I got a bird for my birthday, he was a blue-fronted Amazon, and I named him Boo because it was October and close to Halloween. Boo had a large iron cage. It could have been metal, but very large, sturdy, and like six feet tall, and it was kept in my room despite the fact that Boo, like me, pretty much had the run of the house wherever he wanted. This information will become relevant later in the story. As I ran into the room, I slammed the door shut and locked it. However, the lock was simply one of those little turn knobs that you can easily pop with a butter knife. I had barely gotten the door shut and locked when the person on the other side knocked on it. I have no idea why they knocked, if they did it to mock me or to scare me, but I knew in my heart that the little lock was not going to keep whomever was on the other side out of my room. It didn't keep my mother out when we were arguing, and it wouldn't stand up to brute force. I was panicking, on the verge of tears when the person started laughing. It was low, quiet, and 
Because of that, it was even more frightening. It wasn't like manic laughter, but as if they were genuinely amused. It was the laughter that really frightened me, and I started heavily, hysterically crying and looking around my room to figure out what I could do. That was when I realized Boo's cage would fit almost perfectly between the door and the wall of my closet. The cage moved quietly on my carpeted floor, but as I pushed it into place, it scraped against the door and alerted whoever it was on the other side that I was trying to barricade myself in, because suddenly they threw themselves at my door, and you could hear the sound of the wood splintering and the door handle being twisted violently. Boo, who had been stirred by the movement awake, began literally screaming and flapping his wings. I might have screamed with him, but honestly, I don't remember screaming, I just remember being extremely scared. Terrified, I crawled under my bed and couch, a bunk bed with a futon on the bottom, and waited several minutes and the person eventually stopped attacking my door. Boo continued screaming even after he had stopped. Though being under my bed gave me no feelings of being secure, I didn't come out from under it because I simply had nowhere else to go. I thought about trying to go out the window, but I was afraid he might expect it and therefore be waiting for me on the other side, and it was also several feet off the ground as the house was built on a raised foundation. I remember laying under my bed, terrified, for what felt like hours. I must have fallen asleep because I awoke the next morning to daylight. The fear of what happened came back to me as soon as I registered where I was and why, and scared that whoever had been in my house might still be there, I decided to crawl out the window and run to a neighbor's since it was daylight outside, and therefore I felt less afraid. Crawling out a window is a lot harder than it looks, and I did it less than gracefully, as I was not, and still am not, the most coordinated human being. Once I was back on my feet, however, I carefully made my way around the house, and that's when I noticed that the back door was wide open. Scared, but feeling braver now that I was outside and that it was morning instead of pitch black night, I walked up the back steps and peered inside. Seeing nothing out of the ordinary, no terrifying man leering at me basically, I decided to go in. Looking back, I cringe on how stupid this could have turned out, and that I wish I could have told my younger self to make the smarter move and just go get help, but thankfully, no one was inside the house. I did a terrifying, heart-pounding, room-to-room check, looking in closets and under beds, behind the couch, anywhere I thought even a small child might be able to fit. I even popped the lock on my mom's bedroom so I could check it and then relocked it afterwards. When I was positive that there was no one there, I went back to lock the back door. I had left it open in case I needed to escape and noticed that the breaker box on the opposite wall was open. The main switch had been pulled. I flipped it back on, locked both locks on the back door, checked all the windows and front door and then called my mom, where I once again broke down crying hysterically. She called a co-worker, who came and stayed the entire day with me as they drove back. My mom still took random trips to Florida after that, but I always went with her from then on forward. So terrifying, laughing crazy person that broke into my house on New Year's Eve. Let's never meet again. I sincerely hope no other young girl had to meet you either. I don't know if you were just some drunk visitor of a neighbor, but you terrorized me that night, and I was afraid of being alone when my mom was working, and to this day, I still get scared when I'm home alone overthink what I would do if someone came inside and where I would hide. When the cats make a noise out of nowhere, I immediately investigate for fear it's someone trying to get in. The story I'm going to share with you took place in the North Pole, Alaska, back in May. The incident I'm going to describe was wrong place, wrong time, and completely unprovoked, which no one believes. Another note, I was still only 20 when this incident occurred and could not legally own a pistol yet. Also, I was in the army and if you live in the barracks, you have to keep your weapons in the arms room, so it's not like it's convenient to get that out and carry as 
compared to a guy living off post who can keep his gun in a safe in the closet. I know people will wonder why I was carrying. Those are the reasons. And anyway, here's my story. On the night of Cinco de Mayo, I attended a party at a friend's house in the North Pole, Alaska. North Pole is about 20 to 30 minutes outside of Fairbanks. It's a somewhat rural community, lots of houses that are on one to two acre lots and mostly all dirt roads off the main road. I was the designated driver that night and drove four of my friends, but three of the friends that I brought decided they were going to spend the night at that person's house instead of going back to the barracks. Only one friend that wasn't drinking a lot decided that he wanted to get back to the barracks when I was ready to go. We ended up leaving at about 1.30am. As we were pulling into the front gate, we got a call that there had been a fight at the party. They said after the fight everyone was going home instead of staying the night and continuing to drink. They asked us to come back and pick them up, but said that they had went to a different friend's house that lived in that same area because everyone had to leave after the fight. Well, GPS doesn't work that well once you get outside of Fairbanks and aren't on the main roads, at least not with my terrible Verizon service that night. You could get in the general area, but not always the exact location. When we went to the address that was given, it came up as being in the middle of the road, so we took a turn down a side road to turn around and try to get service so that we can make a call to figure out where the house was. By this time, it was around 2.30 a.m., as we turned down the road, there was an old red minivan with fog lights mounted on top, just idling there with two guys that looked to be in their late 20s inside. I remember thinking that it looked like something you'd see in a TV show or a horror movie. Just a real creepy looking van, especially almost 3 in the morning. We had to pass them to turn around and they looked at us in a way that gave us a really bad feeling. So, we turned around and then had to pass them again to pull out onto the main road. As we passed them, the driver was leaning his head out of the window like he wanted us to stop so that they could ask for something. Being that it was almost 3am, we knew it was probably best to keep driving. My friend wasn't able to get a hold of anyone, so he tried mapping it out again. The GPS was delayed due to the poor service though, and we missed the turn again. We saw a small clearing to pull over, so we pulled over on the side of the road to verify where we were at compared to the street that we had missed. About 10 seconds later, the red minivan with fog lights pulled up next to us on my driver's side and rolled down the window. I rolled my window down and they initiated conversation by asking if we had seen a white Dodge pickup. We said we hadn't and they said, okay, thanks. We then asked if they knew where Meadow Rue, the street we were looking for, was. They said it was the first street on the left if we headed back the way we had just came. We were suspicious, but we looked at the GPS. It showed that was the road. We found out later that the road was on both sides of the main road. Note, locals outside of Fairbanks tend to not like the active duty military guys, and military guys stick out a lot due to the lack of beard and long hair and having a military haircut. We started heading toward Meadow Rue, which was about a half mile away, and saw them pull out and start heading that way behind us. We made the turn into what we thought was Meadow Rue, and this road is a bumpy dirt road and immediately forks off in two directions. One side goes straight and up a slight hill, the other side is off to the left and drops down about two feet and flattens out. We turn left and drop down the small incline. The road was narrow, only big enough for one car and lined with trees on both sides for a good distance, the first thing we noticed was a dead end sign, and that's when we started to get worried. We drove about 20 feet, and then we see the minivan with fog lights turn in and drop down behind us. At this point, my blood turned cold, and I felt a sinking feeling in my stomach. I knew at this point that they were following us. I tried to be positive and hope for a split second that they'd hang back and turn off at the first driveway, which we hadn't seen a driveway yet but then I saw them speeding up. Again, this is a bumpy, dirt side street and there's no reason to be going fast. I started speeding up, and then they slammed into the back of my car, backed off, and then rammed me again. A few seconds later, we made it to a small clearing like a dirt cul-de-sac. I had enough room to pull forward and then reverse myself back so that I was facing the direction I had just came. While I was doing this, they stopped and blocked the one-lane dirt road. They hopped out of the car and one of them shouted, 
This ain't Meadow Rue. Get out of the car. The one guy had positioned himself directly in front of my car about 10 to 15 feet away from the trees in his van. The other guy started walking up to my passenger side where my friend was. They kept shouting at us to get out, but I just gunned it right at the guy in front of me, trying to run him over. He managed to jump out of the way. I thought for sure there wouldn't be enough room between his van and the trees and figured we'd get stuck, but we had no guns, so there wasn't a better choice. I thought we'd have to bail out and run into the woods and hide, but to my surprise, we squeezed through. It was such a tight fit that both my mirrors collapsed in. I then sped out of there, got on the main road, and headed for home. I had seen a state trooper not long before all of this, not too far down the road. I was scared to death of being chased again and then run off the road at higher speeds, so instead of slowing down, I blew past the state trooper while doing 90 and a 45, not exaggerating. Since that is extreme speeding, I thought I'd get the trooper's attention, but for whatever reason, it didn't. There was only one turn on the whole way back, and when I slowed down to make it, the van was nowhere in sight. I still flew back at 90 miles per hour all the way back just to be safe. The next day, we tried to tell our friends what had happened. Nobody believed us. Not one person. They thought we didn't feel like driving all the way back to pick them up, so we made up a story to get out of it. The guy who had invited us all over originally said that if we were serious that we needed to go file a police report with the Alaska State Troopers. So, we went to file a police report at the State Troopers' office in town. When we filed a report, after giving our story to the trooper, he told us to wait and then he left the room. About 15 minutes later he came back in and told us to tell the truth. Confused, we asked him what he meant. He said his theory was that we were drunk, driving around late at night after the Cinco de Mayo party, and we plowed into the van we described. He said he thought the owner heard that happen and then came out and confronted us so we took off. He said to get ahead of the story, we made up the whole thing so we wouldn't get in trouble for wrecking into a car while drunk and leaving the scene. We repeatedly told him that was not the case and said everything that we had told him was true without evidence to prove his theory, and he let us go. The next day, he went and checked the area we showed him on the map. I guess when he didn't find a wrecked car, he knew we were most likely telling the truth. He called and asked us to come meet him out there to verify that was the area, but we told him we didn't want to go out anywhere near there again. About two weeks after that, he called and asked us to come in and possibly ID the vehicle. He showed us a picture of a red minivan with fog lights and we said that it looked like the vehicle from the incident. He then told us that the vehicle was stolen out of Nanana, Alaska sometime before that and it was stolen from an old woman. These guys may or may not have been related to her. The trooper said if any arrests were made, he would call us back. And we never heard anything to follow up after that. To this day, no one really believes my story. They think we did something to provoke the incident or just think we made it all up to sound cool or something, but it was just a case of wrong place, wrong time. It was just a normal Thursday, though I had woken up later than I normally do. I had a test that I was prepared for that day in my favorite class. Since I felt that I was going to be late, I tried to rush out the door at my usual time, about 7.15 in the morning. I was past halfway through the door when my dad called me back to the kitchen. He asked me if I had eaten anything for breakfast, something I am used to skipping since I eat after my first class. I tried to play it off that I did, but he didn't budge from it. He told me to eat something before leaving and I reached for a banana. He waited for me to finish eating it before telling me to have a good day. I got in my car, running behind my usual schedule, and rushed, lawfully and safely, to school. I consider myself a decent and safe driver. I enjoy driving my car, a 2013 Mini. I get to the school and pull into the parking lot at about 7.26 or so, and I pull around back to my usual parking spot since I was a senior and have a permit to park. I park my car, grab my stuff, and begin heading to the gates of the school when I see a huge crowd of other students running from the campus. Instantly, I knew something had happened. I jumped back into my car and drove away, thankfully, but 
I got caught in bad traffic heading out. Traffic was common since the school is placed in a neighborhood and lots of kids get dropped off at the front. At this point, I was shaking with uncertainty and fear. I don't recall exactly what went through my head other than how am I going to let my parents know I'm okay? I didn't have a phone, still don't have a working one, and had no way to communicate with my parents. I spotted a familiar face and I pulled up to ask what was happening. She was one of my teachers and she yelled for me to get out of here, shoot her on campus, just go. And all of a sudden it hit me. Get away from there, now. Sitting in the traffic trying to funnel out of the area, dozens of cops flew down this narrow lane with lots of panicking parents and homeowners. The blaring sirens still ring in my ear to the time I am writing this and I freeze up at the sound of sirens. I was worried about my friends since most had a first period class. I hoped that because they were in the class that they were safe and that they weren't hurt. As I pulled out of traffic, time slowed for me and for once I was lost. I regained my surroundings and started to head home, avoiding the main roads as I knew that they would be flooded with emergency response personnel. I get to the intersection to head to my house and while I wait for my light to turn, police and fire block the road to my home. I decided to turn right and head around yet again. Every couple of seconds I would have to pull to the side to clear the way for emergency vehicles. I pull around to the other end of the hill that my house sits. As I arrive at the intersection the road is yet again blocked off. I frantically think of my options since there is no possible route for me to take home so I head to my mom's office on the other side of town to try and get somewhere safe. When I get to the office I bolt inside and try to find my mom but she wasn't there yet since my brother was getting dropped off at school, different from my own. I burst into her desk space and grabbed the phone to dial my parents. I don't remember much after the call, other than getting water and food and sitting in the main room watching the news as the event unfolds. I was glued to the TV looking for any sign of my friends. To see them on TV would probably mean they were okay. When my mom arrives, she picks me up and takes me home. She had thought that someone had targeted me. I am the least to say different and was at home after taking my brother back. His school was on lockdown and he couldn't get into his class so he got back in the car. I got home and ran into my dad's arms. The rest of the day I watched the news as information was being shared. The hardest thing for me to come to terms with are that I knew the shooter and he was a friend of a friend. Later I found that a freshman girl who I had met the day before, died. Then the second victim. Then the next day, the last being the shooter himself. I couldn't believe that this had happened. And most of all, it was a banana that saved me. I would have been in the quad area at the time it went down. There are articles on the event of what happened, events I am thankful I did not endure. None of my other friends were caught in the chaos and they are safe. The shooter, my friend, and everyone will forever remember the morning of November 14th, 2019 at Saugus High School. And it only took 16 seconds. This is a cautionary tale back in the mid-90s. Remember, cell phones were still a luxury in those dark times, so I didn't have one. I was still an angsty teenager in a bit of a mood. I didn't feel like talking to people and so neglected to arrange a ride home from a late school event. I was delayed getting out of the play and by that time most of my friends had already gone home. I didn't have my own car. My mom worked late so she wouldn't be home for another two hours. My only choice for a ride was my very recent ex and it would have made her drive in the wrong direction anyway. I decided that the best option was to walk home, even though it took an hour and it was already after dark. The route was one long hilly road. It connected several quiet suburban subdivisions of houses and the road was adequately bathed with the orange sodium glow of streetlights, so I didn't feel concerned for my safety. I had a large backpack full of books and gym clothes that I was taking home to wash. The bag was bulky and awkward, but not very heavy. I was confident that I could walk the route without too much trouble. I usually walked home after school anyways. 
About a third of the way on my trek, some guy on a bike starts to pedal past me. He was a much older guy in his maybe late thirties, but obviously trying to dress down and look younger. He wore a long gold chain around his neck, a fact emphasized by his shirt which was unbuttoned all the way. He kept swerving through the empty street, doing rapid figure eights and eventually popping a wheelie. He stopped next to me and asked, What do you think about that? Well, I'm the quiet, contemplative type and not usually impressed by sudden bursts of ostentatiousness, so I didn't think much of his display. Honestly, my only thought about it was that this guy was kind of stupid for doing those things without a helmet. Trying to be polite, I said, Uh, it was pretty good, I guess. Yeah, I'm Mike. What's your name? This was a much younger, more naive version of myself. For the sake of the story, we'll call me Henry, because it rhymes and that's important for later, as you'll discover. I'm Henry. Mike proceeds to circle around the street on his bike so he doesn't outpace me. You run away from home, Henry? I realized that this was a valid question given the huge overstuffed bag on my back, the late hour, and the fact that I was probably walking around with a scowl on my face. No, I'm just walking home from a school event. I realized that there was a weird, hopeful tone to his voice when Mike had asked. Mike continues to circle around and I'm slightly grateful when he wheels away because he smells like sour beer and B.O. Like I said, I wasn't in the mood to deal with people that night, so if he wasn't talking to me, I tried not to engage him. Henry. Oh, he kept trying to engage me in conversation. Henry, do you like swimming? Unfortunately, we had drifted into a darker patch of road, so he couldn't see my patent and annoyed eyebrow arching. Sometimes, I huffed, noncommittally, trying to let the annoyance color my voice. Henry! He drawled at me with each loop he pulled up next to me. After three or four revolutions, I snapped. What? Do you know the trailer park at the top of the hill, Henry? I did, and grunted in affirmative. They don't lock their pool gate. You like hot tubs? Finally, younger, stupider me is picking up on his instincts and cluing into the fact that this guy is a huge creeper. I try to deflect the question. Uh, sorry, man, I, I don't have a swimsuit. He responds. You don't need one. He did another slow rotation in his figure eight, saying my name in long, eerie time to his bicycle loops, and when I fail to respond, he follows it up with, You running away from home? Again, his voice was strangely optimistic when he asked. Starting to get severely unnerved by this guy, I blurted out, I'm going home. There was a slight wobble in my voice. My cool had definitely not been kept. He asked again if I wanted to go sit in the hot tub. I tried to keep him in my peripheral vision but avoid eye contact, and I refrained from answering any more of his questions. I also tried to reach up and loosen my backpack straps in case I had to drop the pack and take off running. He continued circling back and forth in the road to stay at my walking pace and droning that long, gravelly incantation that made me dread the sound of my own name. Henry... Henry. Punctuated by an occasional short bark of Henry. Suddenly the safe suburban subdivisions looked a lot further back from the road. More of them were gated than I remembered. This continued for another half hour. I considered turning down a side street, but the gated fortresses had only receded to shallow cul-de-sacs, and I didn't want to get cornered down one of them. The entire time he continued to chant, Henry, don't you want to talk to me? Are you running away from home? Finally, we reached the top of the hill with the fabled trailer park and hot tub. He cut his current slow circle short and darted across to reach the streets of the pool, and he managed to cut right in front of me so that he nearly hit me with his bike. You want to try that hot tub? Henry, Henry, Henry. Henry? No! I screamed. I do not! 
Fortunately, he actually accepted the rejection for once and started his slow bike ride down the side street, calling back to me. Think about it and come back. You can stay in my trailer if you want. I, I just ran the rest of the way home, cutting across several neighbors' lawns and looking over my shoulder most of the time. About four years ago, I was a line cook at a restaurant that was located in a hotel. I worked at this restaurant for nearly two years with no problem, walking the half mile or so distance it took for me to reach the bus that I took to get home from my job. This restaurant had a partnership with the hotel for late night room service, so pretty much every night after closing the restaurant, one, sometimes two line cooks would stay after until 3am preparing simple things like salads, sandwiches, and wraps that would then be taken to the rooms via hotel employees. Now me, being a recent college grad in my early 20s, would always volunteer myself for the extra hours. Student loans and rent cost a lot of money. As I said prior, I had worked this job for a decent amount of time with no problems, except for one rainy night I'll never forget. As I left my work that morning, around 3am, I realized I messed up when I forgot an umbrella that day. I now had to make my normal walk under decent rainfall. After lighting a cigarette and putting in my headphones, I was ready to make my unfortunate journey. I started on my normal route walking back, cutting through the alleyways I had memorized as my shortcuts through the city. About halfway through my walk, a car started following next to me with the passenger window down. Aware of my surroundings, I had recognized this but decided to mind my business and keep my head down and keep walking. Growing up in a rough neighborhood taught me better than to put my nose where it doesn't belong. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough. Over the music coming from my headphones, I could hear shouting coming from the car. I turned to face the car's driver, but didn't stop walking. He looked back at me. A white man in his late 30s, early 40s with a bandana and sunglasses on. I remember thinking it was odd that he was driving with sunglasses so late in the night. Hey man, where you headed? I could hear him say. At this point, I took out one earbud and replied, What's it to you? To which he answered, I figured I'd ask. You look like you need a ride to get out of the rain. I told the guy I'm all set and that I was almost at my destination. Now keep in mind I'm still walking and he's driving slowly next to me on this side street at 3am. No problem. He replied, Do you smoke, man? Ganja? He asked. At this point, I was annoyed with the guy. I had just gotten done working 13 hours in the kitchen, and all I wanted to do was listen to some music and unwind before bed. Nah, man, I don't. Even though I do, I replied in a stern and obviously annoyed tone. He just looked at me, almost like he knew I was messing with him. I said, Alright, have a good night. Before replacing my earphone back into my ear and taking a ride up a one-way side street, losing him in the process. I arrived at my bus stop safely and within about ten minutes to spare. I was the only one there besides one other man and a homeless man sleeping on a bench some ways up. After about three minutes, that car pulls up to the side of the curb, directly in the bus's lane. This time, I'm facing him. He rolled down the window. You're heading to the south side, huh? He said. I replied, How do you know? He pointed above me. I looked up on the digital board. It said the next bus's destination and time. You want a lift? I'm headed there that way now. He said. At this point, I was all set and the hood came out of me. Hey man, I don't know you. And I don't want to ride, so why don't you just keep coasting? I said angrily. He just stared at me again, but this time I stared back. We locked eyes for a good 20 seconds before the bus approached behind him, honking loudly. The guy checked his rearview mirror, rolled up the window, and sped off. On the way home, I remember looking behind me and my surroundings to make sure this creep didn't try to follow me home. Thankfully, he didn't, and when I got off the bus, I was in my apartment safe within five minutes. Fast forward a week, 
One of my buddies who I work with asked me if I had heard about the body that was found in a dumpster behind the grocery store, less than five minutes from the hotel. I replied no. He told me the body of a girl was found strangled to death, and cops are on the lookout for the killer at large. The cops had no evidence and were asking for people to come forward with additional information. I hadn't told my buddy or anyone besides my girlfriend at the time what happened that night. When I told him my story, he insisted I call the cops and tell them what happened. I told him I would, but I never did. Call me old school, but like I said earlier, I learned growing up to mind my own business and avoid trouble and trouble won't find me, so that's what I did. To this day, I haven't heard anything more on the case. I do wonder if it was the same guy. I think about how weird it was for him to approach me the way he did at such an odd hour of day. The sunglasses, the following me to the bus stop. That stuff doesn't normally happen, right? After that experience, I started walking home with my paring knife in my pocket and walked with only one earphone in the whole time so I could hear my surroundings better. I also stopped volunteering for the overnight shift. I hope whoever ended that girl gets caught or does have a change of heart. It's crazy to me how fragile life can be. I'm a 16 year old girl. I've just started a Saturday job at a shop in a large chain of stores. I work Saturday 9 to 530. Literally the second week I worked there this guy came in. He was trying to talk to me, being kind of flirtatious but nothing major. If I had to guess, he's probably mid-twenties, which is a big difference considering I'm 16, but I do look slightly older so he may have thought I'm 18. I was honestly incredibly bored so I didn't think anything of it. I was just bored and he was someone to chat to as I was ringing up his shopping. Later that day he came back into the store when he was on his lunch break. He said something like, thought I'd come back and see you again, which I thought was weird and borderline creepy. He then tried to give me his number. I was like, don't worry about it, because he was trying to find a pen. But then he went outside the shop to ask every passerby for a pen, got one, came inside again and gave me his number. I had a long line of customers at that point and I was alone on the till so I took it in the hopes that he'd go away. He asked me for my name. I didn't want to tell him because at this point I was creeped out so I just said it doesn't matter. So then he went back into line for my till, bought something and asked for the receipt. The receipts have my entire name on the bottom, don't they? He finally leaves, saying something about how I'm beautiful and we need to meet up sometime. No, we don't. I was working again the next week and he came back in, wanting to know why I hadn't texted, hovering around the tills, basically wouldn't go away. I had already told my colleagues and manager about him, so I gave my colleague who was on the till with me a look, and he hadn't done anything, so there was really nothing we could do. At this point, I'm not making small talk with him, he's really creeping me out. I was acting like he wasn't there, chatting with my colleague, I made sure to specifically bring up school and GSCEs to my colleague while he was there just in case he didn't realize that I was 16. He was probably hovering around for five minutes or so, just not going away. This was probably about ten minutes after the shop had opened, so we didn't have hardly any customers. He kept saying I should have texted, so I bit the bullet and said, I should have told you last week, but I didn't want to embarrass you in front of a line of customers. I'm not really interested. Sorry. So then he was like, oh, okay, well, we can still be friends, right? Obviously, I have to be professional because I'm at work, so I didn't answer that one. Then he was trying to tell me I have a gorgeous smile. I wasn't smiling, and he was being really creepy at this point. In the end, I found an excuse to go out into the warehouse, when in reality, I was going to get my manager to tell him to leave. Apparently, as soon as I left, he bought a packet of sweets and left rather quickly, because he knew what I was doing. Later that day, I went to go on my lunch break. I have the same lunch break every week. He knew which lunch break I had from the first time he ever came into the shop. He said something like, Not long till lunch now, is it? And I was like, Uh, not really. I always take lunch at 1230. 
because at that point I hadn't realized he was a massive creep. So obviously my colleagues and manager know what he looks like now, and my colleague was there when he was hovering around and gave a description to the manager. They also went through the cameras to see what he looked like. It was 12.30 and I went to go on lunch, and my manager came up to me and was like, Don't be alarmed, but I'm pretty sure he's hanging around the entrance to the shop waiting for you to come out. Because he knows I usually go out for lunch. Again, another thing I told him the first time. He was asking a ton of questions and I didn't think anything of it. We were just making small talk in my mind. So yeah, I snuck out the back entrance at my manager's request. Didn't go to the place I usually go in case he knew where I usually went. And went somewhere else instead. Honestly, I was so creeped out I didn't want to go out for lunch at all. But I had to because I didn't bring food and... And I'm not doing another nearly five hours of work on an empty stomach. I got a phone call from my manager saying don't come in the front entrance, he's still there. Apparently while I was on break he came into the store and was asking where the young lady who served him earlier was. Apparently he was trying to say I'd made a mistake on the register and he needed to know when I'd be back so he could ask me about it. Obviously at this point the manager says, look, you're harassing one of my staff, leave her alone, don't come back. Then apparently he was still waiting outside the store when I was due to get off a break. I had to go around the back again. Since then, he's appeared another Saturday. I work Saturdays and he knows that. Apparently no one sees a peep of him throughout the week, so he literally only comes in to creep on me. Yesterday he was waiting around the road that we got up to use the back entrance, so he's obviously figured out where that is. It was around 8.50 at this point and I start at 9.00. One of my colleagues saw him and phoned me to let me know. While he was hovering there, I snuck in the front entrance. He seems to come in, hover around the tills, try to talk to me, then basically run when someone goes to get management. Some weirdo has been following me on Instagram, new accounts with zero followers and no profile picture. Every time I block them, a new one starts following me. I reckon it's him. He knew my name from the receipt and we have a staff schedule up in the store which has our surnames on it. It wouldn't have been too hard for him to find mine. My Instagram is also my first name and surname, so pretty straightforward. Before I made my account private and blocked all of those accounts, I got a message from one saying, I just wanted to let you know you're beautiful, with a heart and water squirting emoji. My manager had contacted the police, but as you can imagine, it's not high on the priority list. He hasn't threatened me or done anything. I now have to get my mom to pick me up and take me to work, plus I take packed lunches and don't go out on my break anymore. Hopefully he'll get the hint soon, or the police will sort it out, but it might take a while. I'm just so sick of having to deal with this in my own workplace. I work at a busy company in Orlando, right in the heart of iDrive. If you're not familiar with the area, that is short for International Drive, which is short for Taurus Central. This meant that I tended to work a lot of nights, which my husband was never fond of. A couple of my coworkers had some weird experiences in our parking lot, so we always left after 10pm with another person, so we had someone when we walked to our car. Us females definitely made sure to do so as well. This night in particular, I closed the store at around 1.30am and was walking to my car, waving goodnight to a co-worker with one hand and already dialing my husband's number in the other. Though we only lived about 25 minutes away from my job, we both liked to call one another when we were leaving, whenever we were, so we could let the other know of the expected arrival. Plus, on nights I closed, it was nice to fill him in on the night's adventures and current gossip. This is also a good time to mention that I lived in a not so great part of Orlando. When I moved there for school, we moved into one of the cheapest apartments we could find, which incidentally meant moving into the ghetto. I didn't mind it much overall, our neighbors were nice and the apartment was affordable for the time being. As I continued my drive home, I became occupied with complaining about my long shift and how I would not be home until about 2am. I turned on the usual side street that connected two state roads, and right at the end of this road was my complex. 
This road usually only lasts about 8 minutes and it ran through a rundown neighborhood, but I always got a bit of excitement turning down it because it was my last turn, meaning I was almost home. As I'm driving down this windy, empty road, out of the corner of my eye I notice movement of another car. As I mentioned before, this road ran straight through a neighborhood, which also held an endless amount of side roads on it that led to loops and circles that were littered with houses. It's very dark, only lit by my headlights and the dim street lights, but I can see a van heading my way out of one side of the street, not even 15 feet in front of me. This next part happened so fast, I had no idea how to react. I see shadows inside the van, in the passenger and driver's seat, then suddenly, there is a man hanging out of the passenger side window with a pistol. He fires off multiple shots straight at a corner house, directly next to me at this point. My heart drops and all I can say is, oh my god. My husband has stolen the phone with me and actually heard the gunshots. He becomes frantic, asking me what happened and if I'm okay. All I can mutter is, I just saw a drive-by. As I pass by the house where the shooting happened, the driver of the van pulls out and onto the road I am driving down and flies right up behind me. At this point, my heart is racing. The attackers are right behind me and the only vehicle on the road and the only witness to their crime. I tell my husband they are behind me and he quickly talks me down and tries to calm me. My eyes can't stop shifting between my rearview mirror and the road in front of me. The van behind me is swerving back and forth on the road, falling a few feet behind me then back up at my bumper again. I say out loud that I don't know what to do and my husband tells me if they continue to follow me to go to our local police station. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, the driver whips to the left and down a road deeper into the neighborhood, leaving me alone on the road once more. I was home within minutes and my husband was just as shaken up as me saying that he can still hear those gunshots from the other end of the phone, waiting for what felt like an eternity for me to say something and tell him what happened. I saw police there the next morning when I went to work, but I never found out how bad or fatal the shooting was. I've since moved from that neighborhood, and will hopefully never have to witness a drive-by eight minutes from my home again. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.